Hey everybody and welcome back to another video and we are getting towards the back end of the course now and just starting to look at some of the more advanced strategies that we can use to help manage your type 1 diabetes. Now this, this video is all about the effect of fat and protein on your glucose levels. Now I know I know we've been talking as if fat and protein are neutral on your glucose levels with the exception of the delayed absorption response that you might see where you may need to extend your bolus if you're on a pump or split your dose if you're using injections. But the truth is they do have a small effect. Now some of you may have seen this in practice. Some of you may be completely oblivious to it and actually achieve good control of having never thought about it. In which case, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it but it's good to be aware of this because it might just help to tie some things together in your mind as to why you're seeing certain glucose results that you can't understand and this might be the explanation. So the reality is fat and protein do have a mild effect and sometimes we do need to add in additional insulin to help cover it. Now there's a few different methods about doing that but the problem with this it does add to the burden in terms of managing the type 1 diabetes because it doesn't, this involves counting up some of the fat and protein calories for most of the methods, and you're already counting the carbohydrates, you're already thinking about correction doses, you're thinking about the glycemic index, you're thinking about any exercise that you've done already, and now we're saying add in fat and protein calculations on top of it. And the truth is, unless you're having a high fat and protein diet, you might not even need to think about this ever. Um, so it's more for those people, as I say, that are experiencing problems with their glucose levels that they can't understand, and this might just help connect the dots and say, ah, that could be it, in which case these are some methods that you can use. So if you're seeing a rise in your glucose levels and you are nailed on that you are calculating the carbohydrates correctly, then it might be worth looking at this, particularly if the rise comes a little bit after the meal. Now, if splitting the dose or extending the dose hasn't worked, keep watching. So there's a thought process that if you calculate um, how many calories you're having from fat and protein and administer additional, an additional unit for every 100 calories, it can help take the edge off. Now sometimes this might need to be taken after the meal um, because obviously fat and protein is slower released compared to um, quick releasing carbohydrates or they help to slow down the absorption of the meal at least. So you calculate how many calories you had and then you do one unit for every 100 calories on top of your carbohydrates. That's method one, probably the easiest one. Method two is, if you are eating at least 40 grams of fat or over 25 grams of protein with carbohydrate, then you may need to increase your carbohydrate ratio dose by 30%. So let's say you were taking, um, Let's try and use easy numbers here. So let's say you were taking three units for your meal. So 10% of that is gonna be 0.3. So 0.3, 0.6, 0.9. So essentially on that in, in that example, we can round that to one unit. So if you were taking three units, then you, the 30% increase would be an additional one unit on top of that. Technically it's 0.9, but we can round it to one to help compensate for the additional fat and protein. Now that is with carbohydrates. Now, in order to compensate for the delayed absorption for protein and fat, it's advised that you, are, you do 50% of your bolus pre-meal and then 50% with a square wave after the meal if you're on a pump, or you can just do your usual split. So 50% before, 50% after. Now, that doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to be 50% that's absorbed uh, initially and then 50% afterwards. You can play around with the splits depending on what the glucose levels do. So you might take 60, 40, 70, 30, and that's where the glucose patterns really lead you in terms of what to do. So number three on the list here is thinking about carbohydrate equivalents. So when we're talking about fat and protein's effect on your glucose levels, it's not the fat and protein itself that's raising glucose because fat and protein isn't glucose. The body is very clever. So when we have an abundance of these two macronutrients in our body, the body doesn't just waste them, it will recycle them and it does that via a process called gluconeogenesis, which is the conversion of fat and protein into glucose. So it's basically repurposing it for a different use and different energy. So it's clever in that way. So that's why we think of it as carbohydrate or glucose equivalents. So the idea is that you add up your fat and protein calories 
and then you divide that by your carbohydrate ratio and that gives you the amount of insulin you should take to compensate for the additional fat and protein. You'll probably need to administer that as a split dose, so a bit at the beginning of the uh, meal and a bit afterwards, probably 50-50 to start. But like I say, find, um, find what works for you in terms of the split. Now, like I say, this is advanced stuff and for most people, it's too much. And to be honest, I do question whether or not there is any additional benefit in adding this in um, on top of the carbohydrate counting because for the vast majority of patients, we find that we can get good control without even thinking about this. And we do not want to add to the burden of type one diabetes because it's already a full-time job for patients. So really where I've seen this come into play is for people that might be gym goers that are having like protein shakes or eating particularly fatty foods quite regularly. That's when this might come in, particularly if the glucose results reflect it. So remember, we're always led by the glucose results. If they're running high and we can't explain it, this is something to look at. If you're in target and you're doing well and all the previous videos have treated you nicely and actually got you on track and you're happy with the results, then my advice would be forget all about this. Have it in, well, have it in the back of your mind, but don't, don't be practicing it on a daily basis because like I say, there is that trade-off between quality of life, managing the diabetes and getting the glucose control that you want. Um, so yeah, so that's it guys, just something to be aware of. Um, another tool in the toolbox, if you will, that you can use to help you manage the diabetes vast majority of people won't need it but if you do now you know about it um, we're getting towards the back end of the course now at the time of filming I think we've only got one or two more videos so uh, we will see you in those videos and um, leave it there for the minute see you later